Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. sing to the Lord today. We praise God for Keith and Kristen Getty, and we praise him for the cross. And you can go ahead and grab your Bible, if you will, turn to Luke chapter 23, as we're going we're gonna to land. Uh, while you're turning there, I want to tell you this story. Last, um, last week, ABC News posted a story online that was entitled, Two-Year-Old Boy Loses Race Because He Wanted to Hug His Father Instead of Crossing the Finish Line. <laughs> So first, I didn't know two-year-olds had races, but evidently uh, this preschool did. Imu Imurin, his two-year-old son, Imu Imurin II, lost his school's race because he ran over to hug his dad instead of crossing the finish line. Now, this took place in, in Lagos, Nigeria, so it went, went global. Um, I've been to Lagos, and that is not a, a vacation destination. Um, if you get close enough, in fact, around... Uh, in Africa, it'll, you'll, you'll see postings along the way, or in the past, it's been this way, don't go to Lagos. Um, but people in Lagos and in that area need the gospel. So that's why I was there some years ago. But there, but, so this story, his father said that his son likely ran to him because that's the way they had been practicing all week. So they're pra he's practicing training for this race, evidently. I, I would run along with him in the front yard, he recalled. Of course, I would always let him win. And when it got to the main event, he assumed it was going to be the same thing. Instead, when his father went over to the parents' area to watch the toddler's race, and his son realized that, that uh, he, he wouldn't be running alongside him, he was really upset. So, spotting me, his dad said, he was overjoyed and he ran to me. Being the hugger that he is, he would usually end most of our races just running into my arms at home. So for him, it was the natural ending. Imurin said he didn't mind that his son lost the race because he didn't cross the finish line. When he came to hug me, I was immediately teary-eyed because it showed me sometimes love is actually the prize. As adults, we need to be reminded, he goes on, that love and friendship are more important than winning trophies. Isn't that a great story? On lots of levels, and I share it for a couple of reasons. First, we need to remember, we're all those who've received the grace of God. We are children of God. We need to remember a few things. First, there is no finish line. Have you come to this? We've sung about it today. Or I could say there is a finish line, the, the holiness of God, but Jesus has lived the perfect life on our behalf, fulfilling all of the crushing demands of God's law on us. God has not changed his standard of holiness simply because we can't get there. But there is no finish line for the believer. Or I could say... Then, secondly, that, no, our, our race, the finish line, is God himself. We're always running to him. He is our destination. He's our pursuit every day. And then thirdly, our love and friendship with Jesus is better than all the trophies of this world. All we need to do is run to the Father who's waiting for us with open arms. Sometimes love is actually the prize. Well, I also want this story to really describe what takes place for us here this Easter season. As we walk to the cross or with Jesus on the cross and consider the last cries from the cross, his seven words, final words from the cross, 
I want us all to just slow down. You know, this past Wednesday night, we heard from seven speakers for seven minutes on the seven last words. And now we get to slow down and walk through each one. And I hope that you won't miss a Sunday. I hope you'll be here during this season of what we call a season of sacrifice, the Lenten season, spring season, the Easter season for us. It's a time of reflection, of restraint, and of repentance. It was Thomas Watson who was the Puritan preacher from the 1600s. He said, confession of sin endears Christ to the soul. If I say I'm not a sinner, or if I say I am a sinner, how precious will Christ's blood be to me? Confession, you see, draws us to the cross because we realize our great need for him. Today we'll look at the first cry from the cross, and it is a cry of forgiveness. And here we will see that we forgive because we've been forgiven. So let's look at the seven cries from the cross. On the cross, we observe the death of Christ, but we also are watching the death of sin. We're watching sin be put to death, the death of our guilt and the death of our shame. In fact, Paul said it this way, as we consider how does the cross relate to our lives today? Galatians 2.20. Let's all proclaim this together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does it mean to live by faith in the flesh? Well, the seven cries of the cross will get us there. So we're going to look at first the cry of forgiveness. This first cry reveals the depth of God's grace extended to us in Jesus, but it also reveals this need and this now new life that we've been given that we now can live and love and forgive, extend grace to others in the same way. Now this message is going to challenge us to the core of our ability to forgive others. What I want you to do is be considering thinking about someone you need to forgive. I want you to think about someone with whom maybe you you struggle with. Maybe it's a person that you feel has done you wrong. Maybe you don't fully understand them. You think they've got it wrong. Maybe it's someone that you're in your family or extended family. Maybe it's someone you've been holding a, a grudge against for some time. Maybe you have an unforgiving spirit. Friend, today I want you to consider this stumbling block that we will confront this maddening thing called grace. Grace by nature is unfair, and grace by nature is risky. Just ask our Savior. Grace might get you killed. What I've learned as a pastor through the years is that attacks on morality come from outside the church. Attacks on grace come from within the church. It's those of us who seem to be or think that we're righteous, more righteous than others, self-righteous, that we don't extend the grace offered to us. In Luke 23, we find Jesus on the cross. And I want to remind you, before we look at this simple verse, a simple cry from the cross, what's happened. Jesus has not slept since Wednesday. I should say Wednesday night. Thursday morning, he wakes up. His, his disciples have gone under his instruction to prepare the last Passover, I could argue, that, uh, that it has ever been. The final Passover with the, before the Lamb of God would be slain upon the cross. It's the first Lord's Supper where we see the convergence of the old covenant and the new coming together. Jesus would have the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, with his disciples. After that, he would be arrested because of Judas' betrayal. There'd be trumped-up charges brought to him. He'd be beaten. He would walk through a trumped-up, kind of a false trial throughout the night. He he doesn't wake up. He, he, He now the sun rises on Friday morning. He's been up. He's exhausted. He is emotionally and physically spent. And now he'll be scorned and beaten by professional torturers, nearly to the point of death. He's forced to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. And right about nine o'clock, the scriptures tell us this procession of the condemned arrive on the hill called Golgotha. They hoisted him upon a cross after putting railroad like spikes through his wrists and through his feet. And they raised him up and they dropped the cross into a pre-dug hole. 
and he's in anguish. He remains silent like a lamb to the slaughter. But now in position to offer the once and for all sacrifice, the Lamb of God speaks. And his first words are a prayer. Not for himself, but for others. It's a prayer for us. It's a prayer for his executioners. Consider this. If you think you've been done wrong and you're struggling to forgive someone, he's offering forgiveness to those who are his accusers, his murderers. And here's his prayer in Luke 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. This verb indicates, you may have heard on Wednesday night, uh, this, this verb indicates, he's saying this over and over again. In the midst of excruciating suffering, the heart of Jesus was focused on others. It's important to remember here that, that God is calling all the shots. Jesus is not a victim. Knowing everything that would happen to him, John tells us. He says it's time. God is is in control. And so Jesus there now is asking the Father, listen, to do what he has done throughout his ministry. In fact, you could argue the religious leaders have placed him on the cross because of his blasphemous claim to be able to forgive sin. Only God can do that. Now Jesus so identifies with us that he withdrew himself from that right of, a, of his authority, and now he's saying, Father, forgive them. But they do not know what they're doing. This, this prayer seems strange at first. Don't they know what they're doing? Well, surely they know they're, they're, they're putting a, a man to death along with two others. But they have no idea what's happening, and yet God is in control. In fact, Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 2, 8. None of the rulers of this world understood it. For if they have, they would have never or would have not crucified the Lord of glory. And yet God was in control. Even in your circumstances of life, God is in control. When you think others are making decisions for you, God is in control. And we need to remember His sovereign reign over all things, even here. Don't miss this, though. Even our sins of ignorance need to be forgiven. He said, even in their ignorance... Forgive them. He didn't say, hey, they don't understand what they're doing. They're ignorant. I'm going to turn my back on this. We're going to pretend this is not happening. And he doesn't do that with you. And he doesn't do it with me. Here's the point. God never lowers his standard of justice to the level of our ignorance. Friends, listen. He's forgiving you and me all the time. All the time. All day long. Even our good deeds are wrapped up in evil motives. I, I was sharing Christ with, with a woman who said one time, she says, I just, it, this, the, the, it's so drastic. This punishment on the cross and so much blood and too drastic. You know why we think that? If you think that, you have no idea of the affront that your sin is to a holy God. You and I are sinning all day long, even our good deeds, mixed up in, in selfish motives. And he's forgiving us all the time. Our prayer should constantly be, Lord, forgive me for I don't know what I'm doing. Even in my good deeds. And what happens is we wink at sin, we categorize sin, and we think, well, this sin is not that big a deal. And so I'm going to place that over here. It's not messing up anybody. It's, it's not, I'm going to hide it. It'll never come out. It's just, it's not a big sin. Friends, listen, that sin put Christ on the cross. Our God is holy, and we have no concept of his holiness. We are fallen, sinful people. We struggle with hell. We struggle with eternal punishment because we have no idea. The only explanation is that God takes sin very seriously and we do not. And today we need to recognize that He is forgiving us all the time. Father, forgive me. 
even now, I don't know what I'm doing. We are forgiven. Consider the implications. The first one is clear. We've sung about it. We proclaim it all the time. Jesus died on the cross to set us free. What's happening in this moment on the cross is nothing less than he is purchasing your salvation. But something else is happening. His forgiveness means that we're called to forgive others. In Ephesians 4.32, let's read this one together because it's a one another verse. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Why forgive? I want to talk about the reason, I want to talk about the resistance, and I want to talk about the result. So many of you who take notes on sermons, or if you want to apply this to reflect upon this week, please, the reason, the resistance, and the result. First, the reason. Why do we forgive? Well, again, it says Colossians 3, 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Why do we forgive? Because God in Christ has forgiven us. That's it. There is no other reason, no other reason needed. We forgive because He has forgiven us. You see, we, this as, this little word as, we're to forgive just as He's forgiven us. Well, as long as they make the first move, maybe I'll come that way. No, as He's forgiven you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, if they show some, you know, pay some penance, feel bad enough for it, I'll make the next move. They have to make... Praise be to God He didn't wait for us to make the first move. We're to forgive as He's... For this is a radical concept that we hardly ever see in our world, and yet that is grace. Grace always makes the first move. Was Jesus' prayer answered? Father, forgive them. Every prayer He's ever prayed has been answered. Every prayer He's prayed for us has been, you might say, well, wait, wait. Didn't He say in the garden, if this cup could pass? He said, yes, yes, it, but, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is crying out that God would forgive them, but He's crying out so that we too might hear this prayer. There's a reason we have it. Friend, you forgive, listen, because of who you are. We sang about this new identity we have in Christ. We are forgiven. Listen, to be a Christian is by definition to be forgiven. That's who you are. We forgive because of who we are. Forgiven. That's as simple as it is in the Scriptures. That's as clear as it is. We forgive because we're forgiven. So let's talk about now the resistance. Why are we such poor forgivers? I want us to consider the stumbling blocks that we have. And here's what I'd say. It's this, I'd, I'd put it this way. An unforgiving heart is an unforgiven heart. I realize we can flip this around. An unforgiven heart is an unforgiving heart. But when we, when, we, when we present it this way, it becomes diagnostic. You do not forgive because you have not fully embraced the forgiveness of Christ that He's extended to you through the cross and through His love for you. If you can't forgive, I think it's for three reasons. Let's consider the resistance. First, you're too proud. You don't feel worthy of the grace that's been offered you, or you do feel worthy. Now, the latter one we get, that's pride. I don't need forgiveness. I'm, that, that's pride at the core. But the other one also trips us up. I've talked to people in, in sharing Christ. I'll come to a point where, hey, you're ready to receive Christ. And I've been surprised along the way when people would say, no, I, no, I can't, can't do it. Why not? I, I don't deserve it. I mean, it's, it's un, I'm unworthy. I've had people tell me that. Of course, the quick response is, of course you're unworthy. How else do you explain the cross? That you're unworthy of this kind of grace. But here's what's happening. When someone says, I'm just not worthy, all that I've done, I'm not worthy for this kind of grace. Here's what you're doing. You, you have yet to confess the one sin that's actually keeping you from God. 
You want to remain in the driver's seat. You think that through your good efforts, somehow the scales will be turned. You're not worthy, so he, he cannot forgive you. You want to stay in the driver's seat of your own self-salvation project. Either way is pride. I don't need forgiveness. I'm not worthy of forgiveness. Either way is the way of religion. So you're too proud. And if you can't receive the forgiveness of God, you cannot love others freely. You never will. You may try to muster up in moments you'll have this great moment of love. But friends, listen, we love and forgive because of who we are. It's not because it's the religious thing to do. All other religions essentially would say, oh, it's a good thing to forgive. Everyone would say it's a good thing to forgive. It's, we don't do this because it's the right thing to do. It's the religious thing. It's because of who we are. Very different motivations. One is out of love. Because of the love that we've received, you're too just is the next reason. You're too prideful. You're too just. Helmut Thielich, a German who survived the horrors of Nazism, he reminds us that forgiving is no simple thing. And he says we even make forgiveness a law of reciprocity. He writes, if the other fellow comes begging to me, I'll forgive. He must make the first move. He says we look for any sign that he's sorry or repentant. He goes on to say, I am always on the verge of forgiving, but I never forgive. I am far too just. Upon the cross, we see mercy and justice collide, and God comes with a third way, the way of grace, where his inflexible holiness and his undying love are met on the cross, and we are forgiven. And we're to live in the same way. But I would say the last reason, the third reason of resistance is that you're too forgetful. This is why what we've done this morning is so critical. It's why we have Christian friends. It's why we're in the Word every day. It's why we pray, Lord, remind me again in worship how much you love me. It's why we need each other. It's why many of you need to join the fellowship of the church. It's why you need to commit to being here every day, every week, every Sunday, being with other believers, because we forget who we are. We forgive because of who we are. We are forgiven we're loved by him to be a Christian again is to be forgiven. How can we be forgiven and not forgive? This is the question that Jesus asked in Matthew 18. Do you remember the, the parable of the unmerciful sin, uh, servant? The king comes to the servant who owes him a lot of money. And he says, you can't pay, so you're going to prison. The servant pleads with the king and says, I, no, please do not do this. And the king has pity on him, mercy on him, and he releases him of the debt. And he doesn't have to go to prison. And he sets him free of all the debt that he owes. Then the servant goes to a fellow servant who owes him just a little bit of money, and he will not let him go. And the question is asked. Jesus would say, how can you be forgiven and not forgive? If we embrace the grace of Christ, we will forgive as we have been forgiven. The only two alternatives, look at this, you have are obedience and disobedience. Obedience is hard, disobedience is impossible. And what I mean is bitterness will eat you alive. You think you're holding it over them. Instead, it's eating you alive. What happens is not only do you need to die to your old self, this is how we grow in grace. We need to allow the Word of God to remind us again of the grace of God and how He has forgiven us constantly. We're prone to forget. We have a, we have a couple of trees in our yard. Uh, our yard is, we have a, a couple of trees where it, it's such that we have leaves falling all year long. Anybody? And what happens now, it's the live oak, I think, right? In the spring, you know, through the winter, the leaves die. And then in the spring, the new growth starts to come. And when the new growth comes, it pushes off the dead. That's how we grow in grace. 
We don't just die to our old way. We've got to grow in the way that we love. And as we do, the new growth pushes off the old and the, and the death is no longer there with us. We now come into springtime of our lives spiritually. So as I close, I want to challenge you with the result. The results, I could say, of forgiveness. First, it breaks the chain of ungrace. The cycle of retribution. If Jesus had prayed, Father, forgive them uh, or, or, or give them what they deserve, there'd be no forgiveness. You see, friends, listen, if we simply say, give them what they deserve, they've done me wrong. We don't enter into this, this area of grace that God's called us to. It's the maddening quality of grace and forgiveness that is, it's unfair. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. Praise be to God. That's the kind of grace that's come to us so first, it breaks this chain of ungrace. Secondly, it sets us free from anger and bitterness. This is so important. Anne Lamott is the one who said, not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. The only way the offender can hold sway over you is for you not to forgive them then you hold bitterness and it eats you alive. You no longer, here's how you know how you, how do you know? That's, this is the question. How do you know if you're forgiven? You no longer wish harm upon them. Now, th there may be consequences for their sin, but you no longer wish pain and harm to them. You have set them free, is the third one. It sets the offender free. Forgiving does not remove the scars from the pain that's come your way, any more than a funeral will remove the grief that we experience. Forgiveness doesn't always mean reunion and reconciliation. You don't go back into a harmful relationship or an abusive relationship and say, well, that's forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. Lewis Smedes wrote a great book called The, um, it's called the, the, the Art of Forgiving. And in it, he talks about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Maybe only God can do that, spiritually speaking. It's not returning to the person necessarily if they've not shown any repentance or change. But ultimately, it heals the relationship. It sets the offender free, and it heals the relationship in many cases, and particularly in, in marriage and other relationships. We find ourselves now no longer hoping harm upon the person, though there may be consequences to pay always for our sin. And finally, it sets us free to love again. It, it reintroduces love into the narrative. In his book, Lewis Smead's he says this, when we genuinely forgive, we set a prisoner free and then discover that the prisoner we set free was us. Forgiveness of others is intrinsically tied to God's forgiveness of you. And you can see now why it's tied directly to the words of Jesus on the cross who calls us to forgive as he has forgiven us. If you are forgiven... You are forgiving. Friends, we are all children running to our Father. You can either continue to try to run to the finish line that you will never reach, or you can turn and throw yourself into the arms of the one who's already run the race for you. He's already taken upon himself your punishment, your sin, and your shame. All you have to do is run to him. And if you're a guest or you're a... a Someone who I would challenge needs to join the fellowship of our church. You need to know this. We're just a bunch of redeemed people who are running to the Lord. He is our life. He's our hope. He is all that we need. And he is our pursuit. In him we find forgiveness. In him we find purpose. In him we find rest. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that all the love we need, we have found in you. And we don't need any, anyone to return the love that we extend because we have all that we need in you. That is a, a 
hard way to live, and it's an amazing truth. We praise you for it today. I pray, God, as we consider the fact that you've paid it all for us, that we would live our lives without demanding payment from others. And I pray that you would cause us now to give our lives fully to you. For those who need to receive your grace, today would be the day. For those who need to join the fellowship of the church, that they would stop just coming and enter into covenant relationship with your people to love and to be loved, to serve. So, Lord, we give you our lives. We respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.